This is Mon Health Live, your source for the latest news, numbers, and vaccine information related to COVID-19. It's what you need to know now to make informed decisions for you and your family. Here are your hosts, Mon Health System CEO David Goldberg, Mon Health Chief Nurse Executive Dr. Crystal Atkinson, and WAJR's Kyle Wiggs. And good Saturday morning. Welcome to the latest edition of Mon Health Live. We are tracking COVID-19 and we're trying to get the information to you. What you need to know about specifically this week, we're going to talk vaccines in depth. We're going to talk about the variants in depth as well. Dr. Crystal Atkinson is with us and uh, Dr. Atkinson, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Kyle. And uh, we may get a drop by visit from David Goldberg. We'll see how that goes. As, the, as this show progresses this morning. Also, Dr. Clay Marsh with us uh, as our special guest. And, Clay, thanks for coming on. We appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Kyle and Crystal. It's really wonderful to be on with both of you. All right. Well, let's talk about the vaccine, where we are in terms of numbers. It seems like Montegalia County, this area, this region, has maybe a little bit of higher percentage of residents getting vaccinated than the state in general. Is that a true statement? Yes, Kyle, we know that, you know, many of our counties, particularly our counties with health systems that are larger health systems that are centered in those counties, along with universities and other entities with a lot of concentrated people, have seen more vaccine uptake than perhaps some of our smaller counties in pure numbers. I think the real key, and this is something that I know that we'll get into during our conversation, is that there is more and more evidence that these vaccines are incredibly effective, incredibly safe. And right now we have reached the point in Mon County as well as the rest of West Virginia where our vaccine availability is is more in number than the number of people that are showing up to get those vaccinations. And we know that about at least 60 percent of our, you know, total population, you know, has not been vaccinated right around there. And about 50 percent of our vaccine eligible population has not been vaccinated yet. So this is really a call to arms to run to the fire, to protect yourself and protect each other, because we have this window, we have this opportunity. And if we start to have the problems that other countries in Europe or other states in the United States like Michigan's having, then the vaccines won't be sufficient to get us out of that kind of problem. Hmm. Okay, so that sounds urgent. That sounds like you you call it a call to arms. That sounds like an appeal to people that if you're not vaccinated, take the steps to to get vaccinated. Now, Clay, the numbers are down. We're not getting as many vaccinated shots in arms as we were why do you think that is? Why the reluctance and the hesitancy for those who have not been vaccinated to get the vaccine? Well, Kyle, I, I think that, that you are spot on. And what we know is that there is a lot of misinformation out there about these vaccines, a lot of concern. <clears throat> Some people feel like the vaccines came too quickly. I would say I look at that as sort of a gift from God. You know, we thought early in the pandemic when we were all staying at home and only had our masks and our physical distancing to try to protect ourselves, that if we could just get a vaccine that could be effective at 50 percent level, we would be so happy. And we have now three vaccines that are approved, one on hold temporarily, but that have, you know, between 90 and 95 percent abilities to keep people from getting infected and getting seriously ill, going to the hospital or dying. And, you know, people are worried about the rumors that these vaccines can cause sterility in young women. That is not true. That they can cause um, COVID to happen. That is not true. None of these vaccines have any of the information that could transmit COVID. That there's computer chips that are transferred with these vaccines. That's not true. One rumor that if you get the vaccine, then you are, you know, have a risk of dying soon after. And that's not true. So what we find is that the misinformation is keeping people from really uptaking these incredible 
interventions, these incredible vaccines that have saved so many lives. Kyle, we have been a really, really effective vaccinating state earlier in the pandemic. And what we have seen because of that, because of that discipline, we have seen an over 90 percent, 90 percent reduction in our week to week number of deaths looking at the end of 2020 and the current week of 2021. So these vaccines have saved innumerable people's lives. And we really just hope that more West Virginians will choose to be vaccinated. Dr. Atkinson, uh, we'll bring you into the conversation here. What would you do to encourage people to put the noise aside, that disinformation that Clay has talked about, and get the vaccine? What would you say to someone who's reluctant? You know, I think it is extremely important that we go to the science. You know, I think that in this age of technology, it's very easy for people to turn to a friend on social media and and hear all of the things, you know, as Clay outlined how all of the disinformation is really overriding all of the data that's coming out every day, the science. We really have to stick with that. I really feel like if people are that concerned, you know, we ha- they have the trust and the ability and the confidence and confidence of their primary care physicians. You know, from uh, they can have a telehealth visit if they're really concerned about that, have a call, just look, look to somebody who actually has understands the science and can interpret it for them. And uh, Dr. Atkinson, you're on the front lines there at a large medical facility, uh, Mon General Hospital, and what's the situation now in terms of number of patients, number of cases? Can you update us on that? Yeah, I can. Um, we actually have throughout our system less than five patients that are actually currently hospitalized with COVID. So again, all of the things that Dr. Marge outlined, you know, that we were waiting for, embracing for this vaccine, as people are going out and they're adhering to the mitigation um, processes that have been put in place in addition to getting vaccinated, I think it's certainly, um, we're certainly seeing um, from a hospital standpoint that these things are really helping. So um, we're we're certainly not seeing our ICUs full as we were um, in the Mm wintertime. All right. So it's working. Clay, that's an indication from, again, the front lines from a large medical facility that this vaccine is working. It's cutting down the cases and it's reduced the mortality rate. Yes, Kyle, that, that's exactly right. And, and Crystal said it very well. You know, our, our philosophy and strategy, you know, from the governor on down has been to save lives and, and really try to reduce hospitalizations. And therefore, we immunize the most susceptible, you know, part of our population to have hospitalizations and to die from COVID-19, which is our you know, long-term care facility population, assisted living population, and then our elders. And the governor called that the Operation Save Our Wisdom. And, and so I think we've done a really good job of targeting those people. We reached our, you know, first and second shots in our nursing home population, first in the country. And, you know, we have now immunized over 77% of our over 65-year-olds with one shot and over 66% with two shots, which is fantastic. And I think is at least in large part responsible for this reduction in hospitalization. And I know we're going to talk about this coming up, but now that the variants are with us, it's really a kind of a different set of problems, kind of a different disease than we faced before. And it's going to really require us to approach this new part of the COVID pandemic with the variants, particularly the one, the variant from the United Kingdom being the most common form of COVID-19 now in our country, that's going to force us to really think differently. And, and, and we will talk about that in the upcoming part of this segment, right. which is going to be really important for, I think, West Virginians to, to understand. All right. We want to get into the variants. We'll take a break first. I want to get into the variants in depth, but Clay, address the 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 largest growing segment of of subset i guess of people that this virus is spreading through are the younger people ages 10 to 19 now the vaccine is open for anyone 16 plus so now's the time for the younger people to get that vaccine as well it's very important to keep the spread down it is indeed, Kyle. And, and what we see is, and this is something that we're really thankful for, you know, we had the opportunity 
when the governor decided to reactivate in-person learning and and Superintendent Birch and, and the, you know, the county school boards all supported that going back to the classroom, that we were able to vaccinate all of our teachers and school service personnel, which really protects them. And, and we got good uptake and we've gotten even more uptake, at, you know, since all this has happened uh, starting January 18th. But we also know that that there are outbreaks in schools, not in the classroom, which is great, where people wear masks and stay physically distanced, but on sports teams and extracurricular activities, and more in these younger people than the adults, than the teachers. And we saw more teachers or more school service personnel adults in the 2020 side of the, of the outbreaks in schools. So it is absolutely critical that we vaccinate and, and, and help people choose and feel safe to be vaccinated for all of our West Virginians 16 and over, targeting that younger population where we see the most spread. But we also anticipate, Kyle, that really soon the Food and Drug Administration will look at the data, which seems to be very strong, and drop that eligibility down to 12 years old, which we anticipate will happen within, you know, the next two to four weeks. Okay. And in Montegalia County, we've got the doses, right? So if they do drop that, we should have doses to begin vaccinating younger and younger children, correct? We have plenty of doses, and uh, Pfizer is the is the vaccine that is approved for all Americans uh, 16 and over. So we, we are not limited by our vaccine, and we would absolutely encourage everybody who listens to the show to, you know, if you are 16 or over, please choose to be vaccinated, protects you, protects your family, allows you to play sports. You don't have to quarantine if other people are infected that you're close to uh, unless you get symptoms. And please bring your families. We want every West Virginian to be protected so that we don't see more people die and we don't see more people who might develop symptoms that may linger for many, many years or even the rest of people's lives. It, it, it is really that serious at this point. All right. This is Mon Health Live, and we'll continue the conversation. We'll get into the variants. When we return, stay with us. You're listening to Mon Health Live for the Saturday morning on WAJR. COVID-19 with the Mon Health experts. This is Mon Health Live. Here's Mon Health CEO David Goldberg and Chief Nurse Executive Dr. Crystal Atkinson. It is Mon Health Live for the Saturday morning. Thanks for joining us. We've got Dr. Atkinson with us and uh, our special guest, Dr. Clay Marsh. And we talked at length about the vaccine and just uh, the encouragement that uh, that we're trying to provide. Uh, if you haven't been vaccinated, go out and uh, sign up and get that vaccine as uh, Clay rejoins us. And Clay, these variants, how worried should we be and how significant is this problem with these variants popping up? Well, Kyle, thank you. And, and as we had mentioned, that we see the variants as a sort of a different disease than the, than the initial COVID pandemic virus that we have responded to. The variants, particularly the one that's the most common in the United States now, and is overall the most common form of COVID-19 in our country, is the United Kingdom variant. And we have seen that variant uh, ex expand as we have uh, done the genetic sequencing of viruses in West Virginia. And this variant is 50% more infectious and 50% more lethal. And as opposed to what happened in the 2020 time period and, and perhaps a little bit earlier in 2021 with COVID-19, where children were more protected than older uh, West Virginians and adults and Americans, that this virus also can infect children. And we talked about the 10 to 19-year-old group being the the group with the highest amount of COVID positive tests over the last seven days in West Virginia. But we're also seeing growth in the zero to nine year old group, which was generally protected previously, and also growth in younger West Virginians all the way up to, you know, 40 or 45 years old. Okay, so with these variants, does the vaccine protect against the variants and those of us who are vaccinated? 
are we better equipped to deal with the variants? Absolutely, Kyle. And, and that is really probably, if there's only one thing that people who listen to this broadcast who have not been immunized yet, who have not been vaccinated, who have not chose to be vaccinated yet, get out of this broadcast is that the vaccines are incredibly effective uh, for all forms of COVID-19, including the variants, to reduce infection and particularly to reduce really severe impact of infection, including hospitalization and death. Um, and the other thing that we've seen, these vaccines are incredibly safe. You know, we did the clinical trials using 30,000 people in the Pfizer trial and about 17,000 people that got the Moderna for the Moderna trial. But now we've, you know, we've put vaccine in arms of over 100 million Americans. And what we have seen is the side effect profile, other than a sore arm or maybe feeling crappy the day after you get the vaccine, are really minimal. And the impact and real world activity against variants, against all viruses, these vaccines are over 90 percent effective in, in keeping you healthy. So so these vaccines are safe and incredibly effective. And we absolutely want every one of our citizens to choose to protect themselves and to protect each other by doing that. Plus, if people become immunized and, 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 and immune competent, meaning that the virus doesn't infect them, that also stops slows down and stops the spread of variants in West Virginia, which gives us more time to immunize more people. Dr. Atkinson, uh, if, if people are, are, I guess, coming to this late, if they're not quite aware of the vaccine or the process to get it, what would you tell them? What's the best way now to get signed up and to get the vaccine? Yeah, I think just go on um, the Internet and go to vaccinate.wv.gov. All of the information is right there. Once you get yourself registered, the next important step is to answer your phone. There's going to be a follow-up phone call, you know, so maybe a number that you don't recognize, but please answer your phone. That, 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 uh, that is the individuals that are calling to just make sure that they are verifying that so they can get you scheduled. And it's an extremely easy process. And there are plenty of places to get this done. The the vaccination hub at the mall, the old Sears location, is still humming right along. I got my vaccinations at Walgreens. I know Walgreens are participating. And there, by now, there's probably some others, aren't there, some other places to get this vaccine? Absolutely. Um, we're also seeing CVS is starting to do it as well, you know, and I think pretty soon you'll be coming to your physician's offices. Certainly call your physician's offices just to verify and see if they're doing that. But definitely um, there's no shortage, as Dr. Marsh has, has shared. Um, we want to make sure that everybody has this opportunity to protect themselves. Okay. Clay, there's there's a little bit, of course, the the stoppage of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that made headlines, and some people got concerned about that. What can you tell us about that situation and, and update when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine might be available again? Well, thank you, Kyle. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine did get paused in the United States, and, and I think, it, you know, you could always look at things you know, more than one way. But the way that we see this pause is this is the federal government being really, really cautious because it was stopped for six individual events right. in, in 7 million vaccinations. And the events were a blood clot in some of the blood vessels that drain blood from the brain, which are really rare. But it turns out that that, that, that complication, which is super rare, occurs exactly the same, you know, before COVID, before any vaccines were there. The reason why the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control decided to pause was because that was associated with a reduction in the blood platelets, which are the blood clotting factors that we measure in the body. And that's kind of unusual. We would think that the blood would not clot, but it would be too thin in that setting. And it implies there may be an immunologic reason why that's happened. So they hit pause so that they could give guidance, because this happened in only 18 to 48-year-old women 
six to 13 days after vaccination, and it's super rare. So, so I think that it will re, the FDA will restart this, and my anticipation will be they'll probably restart it by the beginning of next week. But, mm. uh, but we have to wait and see how the, they look at the data. Okay, very good. We've got about a minute left in the program. And, uh, Clay, anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Yeah, I think the, the one thing that I would um, uh, cover, Kyle, or at least comment on, is that, you know, many people feel that these, vac- that these vaccines are not reliable or they are hesitant to take the vaccines or they're frankly worried and perhaps not trusting in, in vaccines that are made quickly or, you know, uh, or people that they perceive as trying to push the vaccines on them. And I want to make really clear, we're not trying to, you know, push anything on anybody. We certainly respect every West Virginian's ability to make a decision for themselves, you know, and, and, and if people choose not to be vaccinated, that's certainly their right. But this, to me, is really an opportunity for us, you know, to show and demonstrate that altruism and caring for each other that I think has really been the hallmark of our state's response, and we've done so well. Um, And I would also say to people that for me personally, you know, I've taken the vaccine. My 90-year-old mom has taken the vaccine with my recommendation. My wife has taken the vaccine. My 27-year-old daughter has taken the vaccine, and my two sons are in the midst of getting their second doses for the vaccine. So everybody that I love the most in the world have been vaccinated. And I read about this all the time. And I absolutely trust these vaccines to be safe and incredibly effective. All right. That says it all right there. I mean, that uh, that that sums it up perfectly. Dr. Clay Marsh, thanks for your time. You've, uh, you've had invaluable input to uh, to our show here on this Saturday morning. Well, thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Crystal. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, Dr. Atkinson, thanks for your time as well, and uh, we'll talk to you again next week. That wraps up Mod Health Talk on this Saturday morning on WAJR.